my name is Dolan Cummings. I'm an associate fellow of the Institute of Ideas, and I'll be chairing this keynote session, Creativity and Curiosity, Do We Make Stuff Up or Find It Out? This session is in partnership with the British Humanist Association, and we were particularly pleased when Andrew Copson from the VHA came up with the idea, um, because I think it's something which is a, an ideal topic for the, the battle of ideas, and really explores humanism in rather more depth um, than perhaps some, 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 sometimes people think of it. Creativity and cur curiosity are both elements of um, human nature, arguably, certainly aspects of the human condition um, that for many really define what it is to be human, um, to be both creative and to be curious. But I suppose the point of this session is to delve a little deeper and say, what do we mean by that? Do human beings really create? Creation obviously associated with God, um, and human beings um, rather less creative than God, but we don't all um, go along with that idea. What does it mean for humans uh, to create? Do we ever genuinely create anything new, or is it simply about developing what's already there? Is there innate curiosity about finding out something that's already there, or do we in fact impose order on the world through science and through, um, through reason? So those are some of the, the very general questions. I'll introduce the panel in the order in which they're going to speak. First, uh, on my immediate right is Dr. Ken Arnold, who's head of public programs at the Wellcome Trust and author, author of Cabinets for the Curious. Next will be Dr. Tiffany Jenkins on my left, who's the Arts and Society Director of the Institute of Ideas and the author of Contesting Human Remains and Museum Collections, The Crisis of Cultural Authority. Next to Tiffany, Professor Colin Lawson, the director of the Royal College of Music, who also is a period clarinetist and the author of Mozart, Clarinet Concertos, and Brahms' Clarinet Quintet. Next to Colin is Ruth Padel, who's a poet and writer, and the author of Tigers and Red Weather, Where the Serpent Lives, and Darwin Alive in Poems. Ruth also writes a deal about, about the process of reading poetry, and her latest book will be a combination of poetry and prose, Mara Crossing. And then finally, on my far right, will be Professor Raymond Tallis, a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences and author of Aping Mankind, Neuromania, Darwinitis, and the Misrepresentation of Humanity. Um, so that gives you an idea of the, the range of speakers that we have for this um, um, very broad, but I think um, a, a important topic. There's more about them, of course, on the website. So without further ado, I'll give each, as, as usual, five to seven minutes to speak, um, have a brief discussion on the panel, and come quickly to you for comments or questions. Um, so, Ken, would you like to start? Yeah, thank you, Dylan. Good afternoon, everybody. I, I'm going to spend my five minutes uh, talking about the creative potential of the idea of reinventing the wheel. I have to say, every time someone says there's no point in reinventing the wheel, my heart slightly sinks. Uh, and I can't think really of any more flattering epitaph uh, to be written on my grave than he valiantly tried to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> So what I mean by this is, is not the borrowing of somebody else's wheel, uh, or indeed the copying of the wheel off the internet, but the genuine and meaningful uh, notion of reinventing something that's already out there. And maybe, if not reinventing it, then at least re-examining it, reconsidering it. When I was doing my PhD many years, in fact, sadly, many decades ago now, I remember feeling quite challenged by the definition of a PhD which was to make an original contribution to knowledge. And this idea of thinking something that nobody had ever thought before, that would then last for the rest of time, uh, even then felt extremely daunting. And that was before the internet. So now, every half-cocked idea that anybody has anywhere within 30 seconds is on some blog or other. And as far as I can work out, very little of that stuff is ever removed. So I guess my particular interest then, and what I'm arguing for, is to think about the creative potential in things that we think we know, but that probably don't know as well as we think we do. I was struck the other day thinking about Donald Rumsfeld's uh, fantastic contribution to the history of philosophy, <laughs> and that marvelous uh, differentiation he made between the things that we know we know, the known knowns, the things that we know we don't know, the known unknowns, and the things that he was very worried about, which was the things that we don't know we don't know, the unknown unknowns. And of course, he was thinking in, in, in terms of uh, defense, uh, etc. And I thought he'd missed out the most interesting ones, which are the things that we think we know, but actually we don't know quite as well. So I'm here to argue for the creativity of unknowing the knowns. So uh, this is uh, re-examining things that we half know the truth of, 
uh, things that we used to know well, but actually if we think about it, we don't know so well. I mean, arguably, that's the whole of history, maybe. Uh, things that have changed meaning since we last thought about them. And also things that we think in very general terms about, but actually can still be delighted by and electrified by single instances of them. And I guess, as you can probably tell, this is the curator's epistemology. So this is thinking about knowledge in the context of who we find it out from, of where we are when we find it out, what form it comes in, what other ideas it's connected to. All of that seems to me just as important as the abstract notion of knowledge. My job at the Wellcome Trust is to run a, a still new venue called Wellcome Collection, and I think much of what we've been doing there over the last four or five years is taking things that we think we're familiar with and then trying to make them strange, trying to make them mysterious, trying to make us be interested in the things that we already think we know. I think that's probably enough for me, except to repeat again, I'm interested in the creativity of rethinking what we already know rather than searching for new knowledge. Okay, thank you, Ken. Uh, Tiffany. Okay, well, I also want to look at uh, what is creativity, and I want to then look at what is the relationship of art to reality, which is a sort of supplementary question in the very long blurb. And to give it some sort of coherence, I want to try and um, thread through my talk what I think the barriers are to both creativity today, but also the barriers to appreciating what art can and cannot do. So what is creativity? Well, nature and life is tremendously chaotic. It's full of variety and senselessness, but whether you are Shakespeare or Darwin, there comes a moment when the many different aspects of nature are crystallized into a single unity in an intervention by man, whether it is a scientist or an artist in a creative act. And that act charts a new path of understanding. It's what the po poet Coleridge called unity in variety. So science is a search to discover unity in the wild variety of nature. But likewise, poetry, painting, and the arts are the same search. Beauty, Coleridge said, is unity in variety. Creativity is both, then, originality. It is a new understanding, but it is also about order and about making meaning. In the field of literature, the canon is a really good example of this. A great writer will emerge on the scene. Previously, you would never have thought of the book that he or she would have written. But once she's published and it's sort of recognized as a great work, it becomes an inevitable part of that sequence. So the canon is both something that is slightly fixed, but also open to change. Now, I think one of the barriers to appreciate that sort of beauty of creativity, both the originality side, but also the building on tradition side, one of the barriers to understanding that today is that we venerate and we cultivate and we kind of worship only the, the originality side. We are overly suspicious of the essential need to build on a tradition and to making order. And I think that's quite a serious problem. You know, we are told we live in creative times. You've probably been to a number of sessions today where the word creative just flowed off everybody's lips. We're all creative now. We are creatives. Creativity is a major buzzword. It's an overused word, but I think in the way it's used, it also misses some really essential qualities that if we don't hold on to, we could miss the beauty of creativity. So the common refrains that you hear in education and in the arts about creativity counterpose it to a number of different things. So creativity is presented as very different to routine. Imagination versus rote learning, innovation versus conformity, spontaneity versus hard work. And in the kind of Bible of this creativity discourse today, the All Our Futures report, um, published by one Ken Robinson who now lives in California with all sorts of other, I'd say, friendly whack jobs. The Bible for this says that basically everybody's born creative and if you go to school, you'll have it beaten out of you. We just need to release our inner potential. And I think that's deeply problematic because you can only make something new when the newness is perceivable, which means departing from tradition whilst also affirming it. So what is the relationship of art to reality? In two minutes. <laughs> the role of science, I would say, is to understand reality. And the answer to that investigation, to that experiment, should always be the same, no matter who does it, so long as it's kind of right. Um, it is reproducible, that insight you can learn from, but it's a reproducible insight. But for art, 
is a slightly different version of truth and a different version to reality. But its role is equally to communicate a truth about reality. But it's a very different one to science. Um, and that is the truth of human experience. Science can tell us what man is, but art can help us understand what it is to be a man. Science can understand and explain our very DNA and genetics, but art can reflect on love, portrayal, and morality. Shakespeare's Hamlet is perhaps one of the greatest reflections of all, when he says, what piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, but then adds, man delights not me. He's basically reflecting on the beauty of man. So the point I'm making is that the reality that art can show us is true, but it's not a kind of relevant one or one about realism. It's about the sort of complexity of human emotions. And you can't do a scientific experiment to answer these sort of questions, to answer what it is to be human, what it is to have a friend, what it is to be a mother. You can know how to be a mother, you could know how to produce, but what it actually feels like and the importance of that role is something that is culturally um, influenced and also what's something that art can actually kind of reveal to us. So art is a construction of reality, which also crystallizes it for us, a bit like I think I'm half blind and I've now had laser surgery, but when I had it, um, it was like I could suddenly see, and I think a good piece of artwork does that. So there's an immeasurability about that, though. It can only be done in that art form. You couldn't necessarily describe it in any way that is better than the original piece. And yet, I think there are a number of trends today that actually want to do that. They want to remove that kind of mystery, kind of demystify that truth. And it's not a mystery that I think can be solved, actually, and I don't think we should do so. It's intangible and beautiful. So what are the ways that this is happening? Well. One of them is instrumentalism. I think this is something that affects actually everything. Science and art are both infected and affected detrimentally by instrumentalism. And that is, they are both determined to have a purpose by their paymasters, but also by culture. So they're constantly asked to do something beyond find out about the world and tell us about it. But there's also another trend which does involve science, but I don't think it's necessarily good science, and that is asking science to show us what it is to appreciate art. And some of this is brain scanning, where people will look at a picture, and then the scientist, and I'm being, I don't, I should say, I don't think this is very good science, the scientist sort of says, oh, well, this is lit up, so when this part of the brain lights up, that can tell us what art is. And the Art Fund and the HRC are kind of doing all these experiments, and I think um, it's a real waste of time and a real waste of money. What needs to be done in its place is an assessment, judgment, and that's something that only human beings can really do. Only we can say that is good and explain why. Um, and we've got to really get that kind of hope and possibility back. To conclude then, you could say that art finds it out and science, and no, wrong way. <laughs> you could say that science finds it out and art makes it up. But I think that it's far more complicated that, than that, and there is a relationship between the two for how do we know what to find out? There isn't a checklist. I mean, there are certain things we want to cure, certain diseases, poverty, um, all sorts of kind of things that you think you could harness science and technology for. But those questions and that kind of desire to do so is something that is culturally influenced. And likewise, once you know the answer, say reproduction, we know how not to have children, there are a number of questions that are then, you can, you can not have children, but you can also, um, I suppose the point I'm making is that we decide what to find out regardless. So it's not just a question of making up or finding out, the two work together. The end. Thank you, Colin. Thank you very much, um, Dylan. A year ago, I took part in a battle of ideas satellite debate on the nature of genius. I was reflecting then that all music tends to be remade in a way that reflects the era of the performer. The invitation to today's debate on crea creativity and curiosity immediately brought to mind a spectacular case study. The colorful reception history of Stravinsky's ballet, The Rite of Spring, began with its controversial and riotous premiere on May the 29th, 1913. For many of us, the achievement of the rite is that it just exists, a monumental presence arousing the same feelings of impersonal wonder as the grandest works of nature. However much one seeks to explain it, the right seems inexplicable. 
Much later on, Stravinsky must have felt this too, that he discovered the right rather than invented it. More than 45 years after its composition, he wrote, I heard and I wrote what I heard. I am the vessel through which the right passed. Yet at the time of its gestation, Stravinsky had described composing the right as a long and difficult task, a claim supported by his surviving sketchbooks. <laughs> Within the piece, innovation and revolution go hand in hand with techniques in which Stravinsky was brought up and trained. Unsurprisingly, Stravinsky's own relationship with the piece changed radically throughout his life. Listen to his five recordings of the right and then try to decide how he wanted it to go. Many of today's performers are obsessed with historical accuracy, yet it's been observed quite rightly that we encounter the vast musical treasures of the past from the one vantage point available to us, our own aesthetic experience. Our desire to explain everything, even when the subject is fundamentally beyond text, is informed by a cult of celebrity that was unknown in earlier times. Our vocabulary carries a new set of overtones with words such as classical, serious, musical, genius, and masterpiece that would have meant little at a time when music was more closely woven into the fabric of society. When we encounter exceptional achievement, we rapidly reach for that vocabulary. Wow, Mendelssohn started composing only at the age of 10 and six years later produced the octet. We love to categorize him as one of the greatest child prodigies in the history of Western music even if his talent can, in a sense, be readily explained as the product of a natural um, talent born of an artistically and intellectually rich family. And what position does Mozart occupy? In many parts of the world, an overexploited and overexposed Mozart has almost come to represent Western classical music itself. These days, there's a Mozart for each and every one of us. The great man is invoked to sell confectionery, cheese, spirits, and tobacco. You can have a Mozart ski holiday or attend a Meet Amadeus event. A Google search yields more than 8 million items about Mozart on a par with Jesus Christ and Shakespeare and ranking well above Wagner, his nearest rival among composers. Of course, the special quality of Mozart's music is responsible for this level of interest, utterly direct yet emotionally elusive, simple yet infinitely complex. Indeed, his music seems to have a special resonance for our own troubled times. But the Romantics, immediately after Mozart's death, wanted Mozart to be a certain sort of composer, one that he actually had not been. They described him as composing freely. Uh, would Mozart have understood this concept? Of course not. He wanted to be needed and appreciated and to make the most of performing opportunities. Whilst he was conscious of the musical value of his compositions, there's no evidence that he ever wrote for some far distant future. Only recently has research into Mozart's compositional method finally exposed as a myth the notion that Mozart carried all his music in his head, awaiting only some free time to scribble it all down. The usage of words such as creative in connection with the production of musical works of art illustrates our tendency to mythologize. The idea of composers as creators or musical artists in a categorical sense is really a feature of the modern era. Mozart doesn't indicate anywhere that he regards himself as a genius or creator, whilst recognizing that he has genius, a superior talent for making music. In reality, Mozart's pragmatism is evident in many facets of his professional life. He worked within the conventions of his time, stretching them to their limits, but our view of how far he broke those bounds altogether will depend on how far we want to identify him with the generations that followed and how far with those from which he emerged. It's clear that Mozart's principal focus was to address specific situations, such as commissions, concerts, and dedications. At the same time, he contrived to produce a stream of sublime music that really does reveal truths about the human condition, and not just on the opera stage. It's not just that his music represents a heavenly panacea in a turbulent world, but that he can play any role you give him, political or commercial, comic or spiritual, popular or highbrow. So perhaps in the case of Mozart, Mendelssohn and Stravinsky, it's the distinction between making stuff up and finding it out that is problematic. Thank you, Carla. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm going to start with Mozart too. If you look up Mozart on the net, you might find these words attributed to him. When I am completely myself, entirely alone, or during the night when I cannot sleep, 
It is on such occasions that my ideas flow best and most abundantly. Whence and how these ideas come, I know not, nor can I force them. Well, even in the 19th century, this was known to be a forgery in, eight, in about 1815. It, was, it came from the romantic desire to see him as somebody who, as you say, Colin, as Colin says, flows freely. But I'm interested in something else. I'm interested in this sense of when you are writing a poem or painting a picture or composing, where does it feel it's coming from? And it's very, very common that poets will say things like, this poem came to me. Well, came to me in a dream, as in Kubla Khan. But poets say it all the time. Um, Seamus Heaney, who writes wonderfully about creativity in a famous essay on Mossbaum, the, the farmhouse where he grew up, talks about being in a tree above the familiar farmhouse and seeing the farmyard differently with new eyes. And he, he's very, very good at talking about how poetry, good poetry, can make the familiar strange. And that is also, he thinks, the function of metaphor, which is perhaps something we might explore, um, because metaphor is this leap of imagination from the known to the unknown, and it can make you see freshly with new eyes. And I think I want to bring in um, God at this point. I know this is under the auspices of the Humanist Association, but for a very, very long time, the sense that there was something else out there that you were writing for, making a cathedral for, composing from, inspiration, breathing it in, was an incredibly important feeling to have. It, it may be to do, Ray might tell us more about left side and right side of the brain, the, the, the rational versus the um, unconscious aspects to you, the feelings and the thoughts, the way you, you're express, expressing them. But now I want to turn to something that um, Tiffany said and talk about the relation of art to whatever reality is. And I want to talk about history and to take a famous painting, uh, Vermeer's Art of Painting, in which, or the artist in his studio, I'm sure you all know it. There's the painting, there's the artist in front of you turning his head round to face you, and he's got a canvas. The canvas is blank except for a laurel wreath. And in front of him is a nice Dutch girl who's, who's dressed up, who's disguised as the muse of history. Now, it's a very, very common topic then in Vermeer's time that painting was the sort of result of a love affair between the painter and his muse. And for muse, you can take, you can read anything. But here is this girl dressed up as the muse of history but she's dressed up as a menad, that is one of the mad women who are followers of Dionysus. Well, this painting has been endlessly interpreted and it was the one painting Vermeer never sold even when he was poor. And what is, what is, it, what is he perhaps suggesting to us about art's relation to history? That you're, you're taking the muse of history, Cleo, whose name comes from glory. It means um, the Cleo, the muse of history, was from Cleo of telling the glorious things human beings had did. Um, but she's blank. All he's got are the leaves of laurel in her hair. And taking a menad to represent the history of what human beings did is a very sort of unstable marker. So I'm going to end with um, <coughs> a poem about this painting because I think that Vermeer is asking a lot of the sorts of questions that are underneath our session today. And this is just called the art of history, but it could also be called art and reality. She stands beside a death mask under a chandelier, head turning from an unseen source of light. She's holding a leather Thucydides and a 17th century trumpet without piston slide or valve, as if she doesn't know what to do with it and might prefer a lute. On the map behind, south is torn from north, the west on top, the east nowhere. On the canvas, all that shows are glaucous leaves of laurel for her hair. The real picture, the one Vermeer never sold even at his poorest, is himself painting history in disguise as a menad. We might take her hand 
Step her down from the frame. Dress her in jeans and a t-shirt. Open those eyes. She's not a scholar collating an archive, though she'll help if they're fair. Nor a journalist after a story, twisting what's said to make scandal sell, though she's on their side too, if they mean well. She's blood from the heart's right ventricle. Witness and balance, sift, record and judge. Her name, Cleo, comes from glory, telling glorious things we did. But she's a wild one. Look at her, making us feel out of depth or guilty for not listening. Oh, she's foul play. She's dust on a galactic nebula, nothing to do with the day. She'll spend centuries name-checked and dismissed. History's bunk, but she's all there is. Thank you. Everyone tell us, follow that, if you will. Oh, woe is me. First, I'm assaulted by the scenery. <laughs> so I'm expecting a bit of injury time for this. And, and worse still, I've taken the question rather literally. I was brought up to answer the examination question. And it says, do we make stuff up or find it out? And I will see why my fellow panellists were very wise to, as it were, move around the question rather than butt their head against it. But I'm going to try and butt my head against this unanswerable question. Because it is a huge question. Do we make stuff up or find it out? And it can be answered at several levels. On the most fundamental level, there's the question of whether we humans collectively have access to what is real or indeed uh, what we actually have access to is something constructed to serve our needs so far as we understand them. In other words, whether our collective consciousness, far from being a window onto an extra human world, is a means by which we construct an idea of the world that enables us to survive or even flourish, but tells us little about what really is out there in the absence of humans. Now, people who argue for this point to one startling fact. All our scientific theories, our most sustained and seemingly most successful attempts to discover and describe how the natural world really is at the most general and fundamental level, all our scientific theories have been superseded by other theories. As soon as we feel we've got the universe sussed, new facts emerge that overturn our theories. There's no reason to think we got it right this time, because every time we thought we got it right, something turns up to show us we haven't got it right. We have to question idea ideas. How settled everything seemed at the end of the 19th century, and suddenly along came Planck and Einstein, and everything changed in a way we still haven't fully understood. As Richard Feynman said, anyone who thinks they understand quantum mechanics doesn't understand quantum mechanics. <laughs> but before we run away with the idea that even scientific accounts of things are just pretty dreams, let me offer you three things to make you think again. Firstly, science works. It must have something sussed about the world, so to enhance our ability to act on it and to achieve our aims of living longer, healthier, more comfortably, materially richer, and so on. Now, to the pragmatist's assertion that we count things as true because they work, we can record that, re report, retort that perhaps they work because they're true. Secondly, we can be surprised how even those things that seem to be the pure playthings of our creative imagination may turn out to help us get a grip on a material world that doesn't care for our imagination. For example, one of the most famous examples is tensor calculus, invented for fun in the 1860s, which proved to be just the mathematical tool that Einstein needed to develop the field equations that lay at the heart of one of the greatest and most powerful theories of all time, the general theory of relativity. And thirdly, there are scientific truths that seem unlikely to be dislodged, as in the case of Archimedes' discoveries about flotation, or theories that are assimilated simply into larger theories. Einstein didn't overthrow Newton, but simply showed that Newton's laws applied so long as we're dealing with the vast majority of cases where objects are moving well short of the speed of light. Now let me step down a level and consider ordinary facts. Facts are the things that we characteristically discover rather than event. But this is not as straightforward as it sounds. When we investigate the world, the facts we turn up will depend on our interests and on the instruments we use. Even when we're using our unaided eyes, what facts we extract from the scene before us will be dependent on a lot of things about ourselves. Someone says, what's that over there? I say, oh, a blue car. Someone else might report a 2011 Lamborghini or some other bit of junk. A third person might say, just the kind of item a conspicuously consuming, wealthy, exploitative banker would buy. Now, all three of us are correct to some extent. 
in the way we wouldn't be correct if I said it was a green car, someone else said it was a mini, and someone else said it was the kind of item owned by the robber barons in the 19th century. As the Latin origin of the word indicates, facts are facta, things that are made, but they're not made up. That facts are made or constructed in the way that material objects are not is illustrated by asking this question. How many facts are there in this room? The answer is however many you care to name. That some total, total of the true things you could say about this room and its human contents is infinite, ranging from the height of the ceiling to the biography of the person sitting at the end of row Z. So there is a kind of low-level creativity in the generation of every fact. Facts are not the passive products of our experiences of the material world, somehow stimulating our transparent sensory apparatus. But I repeat, facts are made, but not made up. So we have to be careful when we recite that mantra of truth relativists, the thing that Nietzsche said. He said there are no such things as facts, only interpretations. But of course, some facts are more in explicitly infected by interpretation than by others. And the three facts about the card that I mentioned earlier illustrate this. Let me end my remarks by looking at creativity in the more traditional narrow sense, the making of art. Nietzsche, again, observed that we invent in order to discover. And this is true of science, where we put forward an hypothesis to help guide our looking, to turn gawping into observing. But it's true also in fiction, in which invented characters help us to see real ones. They do this because they're not entirely invented. Often they are composites of real people. But this also reminds us that we tend to exaggerate the role of creation in the making of art. Writers, of course, do more than shuffle around pieces of the real world, but they don't generate worlds out of nothing. They may think they are gods, but they're not. What's more, they're constrained by a language they take off the shelf and by the characteristics of the genre in which they're operating, poetry, fiction, or whatever. They put out only a little from the mainland of the already written, as Roland Barthes might say. This means that in a well-established genre, the works are jewels rather than lenses, highly wrought artifacts rather than mere copies of what is there. Finally, the sense that a piece of music which is surely an act of pure creation, of pure invention rather than discovery, has an inevitability built into it, doesn't mean that it reveals something about the extra-musical world. Rather, that it fulfills the expectations we've been trained to have. Well, perhaps not. Perhaps the Pythagoreans thought music refers to and echoes the deep structure of the world, the music of the spheres. And that note I end, and you can see how foolish I was to try and address this question head on and how wise my fellow panellists were. Thank you. Okay, thanks to all the speakers. Um, before I come to the audience, I suppose there does seem to be a general consensus against the more extravagant romantic idea of creativity. I haven't heard anyone... Um, insisting on, on human ability to create uh, something radically new. So we, we've had the idea of un, unknowing the knowns, or, or Ruth talked about uh, making a familiar strange, um, this idea that, uh, that, that, that what we call creativity is really about rediscovering, um, reinventing, um, uh, as Ken put it. Is that all there is to it? Is there anything to be said for this romantic idea of the artist as creator, or is that something that we should just get over? Um, Anyone want to respond to that? You've got to define creativity somewhat. And it seems to me there is creativity in my making sense of this room as I look around myself, or look around it, you know, bringing it together. Indeed, that unity and variety, I think that um, Ruth referred to in Coleridge, I think it was Ruth, is precisely what is normal about the visual field. We see a unified visual field and we bring it together in a, you know, all its various contents. Mm -hmm. That is a low level creativity. If you're thinking of creating something absolutely out of nothing, then none of us does that, I think. We're all of us uh, happy prisoners of traditions. We're all of us use instruments that have already been created by our predecessors. And none of us, as it were, creates the equivalent of uh, what God is supposed to have done uh, at, at the creation. He didn't, by the way, but that's a humanist view. Yeah. We'll come back to that. <laughs> Ken. I'm, yeah, I'm struck by the sense that creativity is a process, and we've talked quite a lot, I think, about the beginning of the process, but, but the end of the process is equally fascinating, I think, and that's to do with what happens when we share creativity. Mm. So, you know, so many of us, uh, all of us, have creative things going on uh, in our minds all the time. Uh, 
most of them not worth sharing. I think all of the things that we on the panel have discussed as exemplars of creativity are lodged there because of how they've been shared. And I think my sense is there is a creativity of the making, the imagining, the capturing, but then also the, the sharing of it. And, you know, we're undergoing in this room a sort of small, arguably, certainly from my perspective, rather low-level version of this, of trying to convince people. And the art and the creativity of getting your ideas across to somebody else, whether it's through an elegant scientific theorem or a wonderful poem or a, a fantastic piece of music, it's that moment of putting it outside of yourself and in front of somebody else. And there is a lot, it seems to me, that we mean by creativity in that moment of uh, making a connection with other people. Yes, I go along with that completely. Um, that I think that in, in creativity, there are always sort of three, three perspectives, three, three parties to it. There's the person who's making something. You could have a child playing with Play-Doh, or you could have <coughs> chipping and make, making a chair. Um, but you're making it for. You're, you're making the chair for someone to look at, for someone to, to sit on. So there's you, and there's the chair, and there's the other person, the gaze of the other. And that's why God, to bring it back again, was so useful, because he could see what you were doing. Um, and there was a sense of, a dative sense of doing it for him, as it were. Um, and it is this sharing. I mean, Les Murray, wonderful Australian poet, all his collections are just... Um, dedicated to the glory of God. And it's somehow, I think, easier to bear if, this one, if you think it's wonderful, <laughs> that it hasn't come from you. I think that's a very interesting, or it's for somebody else. Thanks, Well, Colin. forgive my bringing music back into this. I mean, Haydn said the thought of God made him jump for joy, and a very convenient thing to say, yeah. because a lot of his church music does have that spirit, and, and uh, might have been subject to criticism for that reason. Um, I keep thinking about the internet during this conversation, that actually in the year of Mozart's birth, I mean, the internet, in a sense, was waiting to be uh, invented. But I think his 40th symphony wouldn't have turned out as it did had it not been for the circumstances surrounding it. There's a great scene in the Amadeus film when Mozart storms onto the scene and the great musician for him, is it Salivari? Salivari. 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 Yeah. Just realises he's just rubbish in comparison. And it's a wonderful moment because you can really relate to him. Because um, we all have those people who come in and they're just a million times better than we are. Um, and I just wonder if there isn't something in the artist as creator, actually, um, Dolan. I just wonder about that, particularly now. You know, there's this play called Anonymous coming out about Shakespeare, and basically arguing it wasn't him, couldn't have been him. And I think we're a bit, re bit easily, we easily want to pull down the individual creator today, and that just makes me a little bit comfortable. I think we're far too keen to talk about sharing and democratization, and I just think perhaps that kind of the individual there is perhaps, certainly historically, has been stronger. They may have worked within certain historical circumstances, of course, and there's a dynamic relationship between the two, but I think I would champion the artist as creator a little bit. A lot of artists don't make for an audience. They make for their art. They want an audience, but they don't make for them. I completely support what Tiffany's implying, because the assumption that we're all equally creative, I have to tell you, anybody had to listen to my string quartets would want to slit their throat. So it's absolutely the case that there is an amazing non-equality of distribution of talent and of things worth looking at, listening to, and so on. And uh, one of the depressing things behind the idea of we're all equally creative is that vast numbers of people, for example, write poetry and never read the bloody stuff, apart from their own. And it's this idea that there is even distribution. There is something absolutely spectacularly mysterious about something like Mozart. I remember that scene, Amadeus. I mean, Salieri just thinks, doomed. And he was bloody good, actually, Salieri. He listened to some of his stuff. It's pretty good. But it, it, it does seem to me that one explanation does not lie in the brain. Uh, neuroaesthetics is utterly and totally bankrupt. It is a disgrace to neuroscience, and it's a disgrace to art criticism. But that's uh, another, another story. Yeah. I, it's, it's just chiming on that last point. Raymond, I, th I think Colin said something about the, the need for a myth of creativity. And it does seem to me that, uh, you know, arguably what we're doing on this panel is reducing the opportunity for, for creativity. Because I think there is a strong sense I have that the closer we come to thinking we understand creativity, the less likely uh, we are to be creative or indeed to be interested in what 
it is, that there is an essential myth and there's an essential mystery at the heart of creativity, and I guess I'm also quite keen on championing that perspective. Okay. Um, interestingly, actually, in, in Amadeus, Salieri curses God for giving all this talent to the monkey Mozart and not to him. Mm. Um, so, I mean, th there is this idea that it must come from somewhere. Or, I mean, so Ruth talked Ruth can mm. any of this idea of the transcendence, something coming from, from beyond. Is it that certain people are able to, to reach out to something? Or is that just mysticism? Well, I, I, I've said that I think there is a position where words just run out. And, I mean, I, I've said beyond text, same thing. We were, we're all saying this I mean, to some degree. I've got to protest about all this use of Amadeus because it actually proves what I was just saying. We've rethought Mozart for our own times. I mean, mm. it's all very interesting. But, you know, Salieri wasn't necessarily like that. Uh, we love to believe it. And uh, uh, I was talking about remaking Mozart. You're proving it. You're regarding Amadeus <laughs> as some fantastic source. It's, a, you know, a lot of it's baloney. <laughs> um, I want to put in here a word for craft because it seems mm. to me that craft is what represents the sort of sharing element that um, Colin was bringing up. And, um, you know, you, you have to have the craft. That's why it's so annoying when you, for instance, judge a poetry competition and you see thousands of poems that are written by people who clearly haven't, as Ray said, read other poems. And, you know, judging one once, a friend of mine said, well, would you taste the bread of a baker who'd never eaten anybody else's bread? <laughs> um, so you have to have the craft, and then you have the people who have naturally got it, who have a natural talent. Um, and, and you know that. You know that even when the poem is badly made, you just know that they've got something. Um, so, of course, the talent is unevenly distributed, but it's got to be, it's got to be addressed through the craft. And that's what Mozart, Mozart was, you know, writing his clarinet concerto partly to pay the rent, as I understand it. I mean, because he had a commission. He was inspired, but he didn't write because he was inspired. He wrote because he had a friend and worked on it with him for three weeks. Mm. Uh, so a sort of pragmatic tale again, so I agree. Yeah. Mm. Okay, on that note, I'm going to come to the audience. Firstly, yeah, this idea that science has nothing to say about beauty, it's as false as saying that it has, you know, it can it completely explain beauty, saying that it can't explain love or that it can explain love, they're, they're equally false positions. Uh, and certainly if you would consider someone who, or the people who are able to, to, to navigate both, someone like Leonardo, uh, he would not have found the notion that science had lots to say about love strange. Uh, on uh, anom uh, Anonymous, the play, and now Roland Emmerich's film, uh, it just says that, I'm not ruining terribly much, Edward de Vere wrote Shakespeare, but it still, um, in some sense, fetishizes the individual as the original genius creator. And I think uh, Professor Tallis had some profound things to say about that, that much of what is repurposed is taken to be original and absolutely creative. Um, I'm running out of time, so I, I will just quickly say, um, at the level of the brain, pattern recognition is in large part what drives our intelligence. I'm aware that I'm chumming the water for Professor Tallis here, but that explains much of um, uh, much about our creativity. We can't explain everything, but it's not a coincidence, for instance, that the uh, Renaissance took place in coffee houses. Uh, pattern recognition is at the level of the brain uh, enhanced and driven by dopamine. Dopamine agonists uh, encourage creativity. This is why you have so much, I said in a previous uh, debate, so much drug use in creative professions. It's super helpful, dopamine. I noticed that you confine creativity a lot to humans. Of course, we do know, for example, for um, higher apes, they can be quite creative, it's, it's well known, actually. And in fact, uh, people are looking at, for example, robotic, where we understand the robots. Now, the classic robots are very boring because they do just what we tell them. But there's a new way of handling robotics, which is basically based on how the robot fits into its environment, which, if you look from out the outside, you don't know how it's built, it looks creative. So you could actually say that the creativity there comes from the interaction of the robot with this environment. So the environment, the fact that the environment has structure, gives the robot the ability to become creative. Now, of course, on a very primitive level, but uh, it does not exclude, or that is an indicator that humans rely a lot on the fact that their world has structure to get their source of creativity from there. I want to stick up for the romantic extravagance of the imagination and I'm going to uh, corral um, William Blake in my service here and William Blake um, said that the imagination was the human form divine and that idea driving that that there it's 
as, as creative um, people, we don't just reflect the world, that there's a spark within us that can actually change the world. Remember, there were a few odd uh, revolutions going on in Blake's time and in the Romantics' time. And the question I want to put to the panel is, have we given up on that idea of the imagination now as something that can actually change the world and change the way we see the world in art and in science and in politics? I think Ray Tallis did exactly the right thing by grappling with the question head on, and I want to pick up on where he ended with the Peter Gaines. You know, the question of whether order is discovered in the universe or imposed on the universe, it's the most profound philosophical question at the heart of science. It's well worth grappling with. It's arguably, ultimately, irresolvable. Um, and it's summed up nicely in Galileo's statement that, that mathematics is the, is the language of nature. Um, and if we're ever to establish, if, if extraterrestrial in intelligence exists, for example, and we're ever to establish communication with extraterrestrials, a question we're addressing uh, tomorrow morning, the que then the question of whether mathematics is the language of nature or a language for nature uh, will, become, uh, will become very relevant. But for me, the key thing is, you know, etymologically speaking, culture is the opposite of nature or exists in opposition to nature. And I think, in that sense, we could do with a bit more culture in science, not in the neuroaesthetics and all that nonsense, um, but in the sense that, you know, it, it's possible and desirable to make sense of the world and, following on from that, to change the world. And we need to put that understanding back into science, otherwise what's the point? Whenever I come to these sorts of conferences and I see the panels such as this and I think, you know, there's a, such amazing people involved in, in art today. Why is it that, you know, when you go home, you, you don't feel that it's there out in society, that this sort of high level of thinking that you're talking about is out there in society. And that, you know, in the same way that Tiffany was talking about, things that actually aren't, aren't that special are celebrated. Um, and um, I, I'm just um, doing a PGCE at the moment and in early years. And one of the areas where creativity is talked about in a great, de a great deal is within childhood, how we should let children be creative. And the way that um, they discuss letting children be creative is by letting them play and discover things for themselves. Um, and um, I, I very much like the idea that, um, sorry, I can't remember your name, but the poet, poetess were talking about uh, the idea of the need to learn your craft, learn your five finger exercise, um, and the need for, um, uh, to work at something and learn poems by rote and that kind of thing. Um, it, and it just strikes me, you know, why is there as, um, such a big gap between what it is we're trying to do in, in society and, and the, you know, the, the, the talent that is here today that actually does come from hard work. And I think this is where the issue of Mozart comes in and why we, you, we're kind of scared to celebrate Mozart for who he was. Um, and we want to celebrate him as a gift from God or from something or something. Because actually what Mozart represents isn't the genius, in my mind, isn't the genius of one man. What Mozart represents is the genius of men um, embodied in one man, because it's through what went before, it's through the conditions that he was in that created that. But, but what we seem to be doing now is, is relying on the genius developing um, automatically by le letting the children play, almost. <coughs> Okay, well, there's a lot there. I'll, I'll, I will come back out. We've had dopamine, apes, um, the romantic imagination, <laughs> mathematics, learning by rote, children's, children's creativity. Ray. Uh, first of all, regarding dopamine, I mean, basically, the dopaminergic theory of artistic creation and appreciation will not enable you to distinguish between having your organs played with, sex, and having hearing an organ toccata bark. The same, <laughs> same. So it, it suggests that the science isn't very good. The second thing is I very much like the reference to the romantics because there is the distinction between fancy which merely moves tokens around the place and imagination which wells things together in a totally new way and I still think that is a live and real sense of what creativity is about. But it's Sandy's point I wanted to respond to because I think the great humanist challenge that we face at the moment is to understand the fact that the world makes sense to us, the greatest mystery of all, and the extent to which that sense is imposed upon us by us collectively and the extent to which it's something we extract from or find in the world. And there is a concept of logos, which has gone right through Christian, pre-Christian, and even contemporary thought of the intelligibility of the world and different takes on the notion of intelligibility, why it makes sense. Was it implanted by God or is it extracted by us? I think is one of the key ideas for those of us who are humanists who want to think seriously about what human beings are and what their place in nature is. Well, I, I, to answer the point about dopamine, why are we asking science to explain to us what it is to be in love? I mean, do we not have our own experience that does that? 
do the arts not do that for us? I, I'm interested in why we kind of want to dispel that mystery and kind of pull it down and tear it apart. I also don't think it can tell you anything about being in love at all. It can't tell you what it's like to swoon in front of somebody, to kiss somebody. Maybe Rodan can. Rodan can tell you what a kiss is. But certainly, I don't, I'm unconvinced that any, any kind of science can. And I'm suspicious of that quest. I'm suspicious of why things that are human creations and human understandings kind of have to be dispelled by, I think, a very uh, kind of suspicious type of science. Um, somebody made a point about imagination. I mean, if you look at the arts, it's very interesting that, in fact, I think they're suspicious or scared almost of imagination. Everything has to, if you go to a museum, it has to be kind of directed interactive with sort of interactives and headphones and lecture series that go on forever. I'm not a Philistine. I like to kind of have these things enhanced, but the direct appreciation of man and the object or mankind and, and uh, the picture, um, I think, is very much neglected. So there are certain things about being human which are about beauty and love that I think we're trying to dispel, and I think that's probably a little bit unfortunate. Okay, Ken and then Ruth. Yeah, you know, also on that point about imagination, I, I, I feel myself completely torn between two very uh, opposed views of where we are with our imagination now. Part of me thinks because of the ready availability of all of our tools, uh, particularly digital tools, that we have more access to the possibility of creating things. All of us uh, on our uh, MacBooks can do a bit of composing. We can all find thousands of images. We can curate our own shows. Uh, you know, we can manipulate images. So there is a sense in which uh, there is an ease of creating new things and therefore a, a sense in which we might be in an era of completely universal creativity. Uh, and then I have to say I have a very <laughs> different sense at the same time, which is we are drowning uh, in everybody, uh, everybody else's and our own half-cocked attempts at creativity and therefore you know, by 10 o'clock in the morning, we've seen a thousand images, mm. and the spur to creating things, I think, is leaving us at the same time that we are equipping ourselves with the most extraordinary tools to create. And I, I suppose I end up with the sense that either we're going to stop creating entirely because we can't see any point of it, or uh, we are going to be going through an age of the most extraordinary creativity. I, I don't know which is going to happen. So what would that creativity look like? I just think it's bizarre that we, we say we're on the cusp of all this creativity if we can't even say what it's for. I mean, it just seems to me that we're kind what of killing ourselves. What it is or what it's for? Either. If we, if we say there's a huge amount of creativity around, what is it? Where I'll, is it? I'll let Ken you know, think about so. that. Well, I'll just, I'll, I wanted to go on to Im two words, imagination and mystery. Um, and yes, I'm, of course I'm with imagination, Blake, and so on. Darwin said, you can understand the true conditions of life only if you use your imagination to hold on to a sense of the ruthlessness of the natural forces that could waste the bright surface. And I want to hold on to this sense of imago in imagination. And imagination is, is the power of seeing some, I think, we, we could discuss it, um, as the power of seeing something that isn't there, isn't yet, hasn't yet come into come into being. And that's why, I mean, I think I might differ from Tiffany on this, that I can see why scientists would want to explore what being in love is from a scientific perspective. It doesn't lessen, lessen Rodin's kiss at all. But, um, I mean, for instance, there's, that's the mystery. Science wants to explore mysteries, just as art does. Um, I've been working recently on bird migration, or migration of lots of things. And I was reading something about the extraordinary things about magnetite in the back of the skull and how they go and how they know where to go and when and everything. And somebody in the audience afterwards said, but isn't that undoing the mystery? And I thought, no, it's just putting the mystery further back in a different place. It is extraordinary that a bar-headed geese have evolved ways of putting the oxygen deeper in the capillaries of their muscles so they can fly over Everest. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing, and that's a mystery itself. So science has its mysteries, and they're different sometimes from arts, but we can still wonder at them, and we can still try and learn to represent, find out about them, discover them. 
Okay. Just on the last intervention from, from the audience, I think we've got to be careful about not getting too UK-centric when we get into educational matters and what children do and the position of arts. And actually, one of the problems, I think, is you forget what's in your soul. You lose track of what's in your soul because you're going after funding all the time. You forget when you wake up in the morning what you actually think yourself because you've been so conditioned. Um, and finally, um, uh, uh, for this little patch, Genius is Meaningless Without Society was the name of, of, of that tranche of debate that I took part in and uh, of course absolutely true okay thanks yeah i just want to say do you think that creativity can be taught in any way if it's it's a talent that you're born with and it's something humans clearly have the power to do and animals i, I haven't ever read any research but i think they probably do but it's then kind of going into ai and trying to kind of make computers make technology that much better can you ever is there any way of getting to a point where we can start programming creativity but also on the young children, is there any way of, if they're not born with that talent, kind of, if they put the hours in, can they ever get there kind of thing? I think that as a principle, going back to the, one of the original points, I think that there are no original ideas at all. And what we perceive as being so are just build-ups, cultural, cultural build-ups from what we've gathered from our historical and cultural past. Which brings me to one of the, uh, Bertolt Brecht, a German playwright, had as one of his mo pract practice uh, theories was to always be questioning himself. And I think that's to some extent what creativity is all about, is questioning what we are doing, regardless if it's arts or science or any other practi uh, practice. Even lawyers do keep questioning their own practice in their sort of twisted way. Uh, so I think that all in all, it's not about trying to reinvent the wheel, but to question what the wheel means and what do we use it for. About 60 years ago, um, I read the title of an article, didn't read the article, title of an article in the Reader's Digest. <laughs> the secret of life is curiosity and discontent. You haven't mentioned discontent. Does it fit in with creativity? Hello, uh, I'm just going to take issue with uh, my friend at the back here and stand up for creativity. I was, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was, uh, Paul Barand uh, passed away, who uh, we all know was the inventor of the packet switching network concept. Now, of course, before, upon which, of course, the internet is based, our cell phones are based, before, before he'd, he'd had that sort of uh, <coughs> breakthrough concept, um, everybody in the world who was involved in telecoms knew that 80 telephone calls was the maximum you could get through a pair of copper-twisted copper pairs. And of course what he did, of course, by, by, by having, that, by having that, that insight, by having that uh, creativity, he, he vastly increased the amount of information you can send down, down a, 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 the, same, the same physical uh, device. So I think, I think uh, and of course once, once he'd made that breakthrough, of course, it was obvious. It was obvious to everybody then, of course you can do it that way. Uh, and then there were various other networks were, were evolved. So I think, you know, I think there wasn't anything like that before. It didn't exist. There wasn't anything. So before he, before he had that concept, there wasn't anything. Once he'd had that concept, it was blind, blindly obvious to everybody. So I think there is creativity. So I, just to, to the panel, I think, you know, could we say a bit more about creativity outside of the arts? Uh, that's the first thing. Um, and secondly, yeah, let's stand, up, let's stand up for the creatives. Just a few thoughts to share. I feel a lot of emphasis has been spent on um, the external relationship. I mean, um, if, if I think of certainly the sort of education, formal and informal, that I've received in the past, the majority of it is spent on dealing and understanding with others, with the external world. Um, and not enough attention or emphasis spent on looking at the inner self in understanding ourselves. And you know, the consequence of that is when we talk about science, we automatically think of that's trying to help us to discover the outside world. And when we talk about creativity and art, that is a reflection of our understanding of the outside world. I think that's just one side of the story. I think the good science and good art comes from within ourselves, the deeper of an understanding we have of ourselves, better science and better art we could create. And the second point I want to make is about your um, view of um, <clears throat> there are certain things, for example, like love that cannot be explained by um, science and why do we want to dispel that uh, mystery? Um, 
My argument is the fact that there is a mystery, a mysterious element to it, doesn't mean the same issue cannot be looked at um, from a different perspective. I do think there is a chemical basis for many things, for love, for other feelings, but does that explain it all? It doesn't. There is the mysterious part. And the final bit that I want to mention is, um, we began talking about originality. I just feel we should look at probably um, originality on different dimensions. One is vertically looking at historically whether there have um, there are people who've had the thoughts or ideas in the past before, but another dimension is horizontal, is to looking at whether it comes from within. That is also a measurement of um, originality. Although it's true that it helps to have a knack for things like drawing or music, it does help, but artists I don't think are born, they're made. And Mozart had a talent, but he was actually, he was, you know, he was doing music from about the age of dot, and he did it for years and years and years, and I think I think that there's, it's a combination of play and hard work that makes creativity work. Picasso said that every child is an artist, the difficulty is remaining an artist when you grow up. And I think it's ready to do with getting the ego out the way because I don't agree with the man that said, whoever it was that said, creativity is about questioning all the time. I think that if you, if you sit down and think, I'm going to create something, and then you spend all your time thinking, is this a waste of time? Should I be doing something else? Is this all a load of rubbish? That's why you all get, you get creatively blocked and you never do anything. And I think science, when science, create, when science discovers new things, it's basically, it's happening when you're exploring without the, the, the impulse that you've got, to, the pressure to get results. When you can actually indulge in creative play, trying to explore and find something out, and you can do that for you know, a really long time and do it daily, that's creative play, and that's the, the link between science creativity and artistic creativity, I think. I just have to say, I think the inward turn for art is, is, is pretty gloomy and doom-laden, actually, because I think, a lot of the art today is, is all the worse because it has, is precisely very limited to people looking very narcissistically into, themse into themselves. Now, I'm not saying that uh, art is, is not to do with individual subjectivity, but the individual artist on, it, on his or her own is fairly limited, right? Nothing, anything that's going to be rich and worthwhile and creative, whether or not it reaches genius level or just very good art level, I think can only come about when that individual subjectivity is drawn out of itself in an outward direction through engagement with things around it. Now, that doesn't mean artists have to go around, you know, being actively engaged in society to, 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 get, the, um, to get the inputs to develop their creativity. Traditionally, it's been done through education. It's been done through cultivating the aesthetic sense, through craft that Ruth mentioned, through long apprenticeships, all the great Renaissance artists, you know, worked for years in studios in a minor capacity, learning their craft. And, um, you know, and through that, through that, through the intermediary of knowledge, aesthetic knowledge, artistic knowledge, that individual subjectivity can become greater. And I think everybody can benefit from that, whether you achieve Mozart status or not. Just finally, on the um, science thing, can, you know, science wants to is interested in mysteries. It is, but I think it's also part of human, developing human knowledge is understanding the limits of each category. So science can develop, can, is, is legitimate to look into mysteries in a certain sphere of the physical world, but things like love and art belong to a different realm, I think, which is not sort of different in the sense of being out of this world and not unrelated to it, but it is a separate category and, the, and has its different criteria. Thanks. Um, I'm a mathematician and uh, I constantly flip-flop over Sandy's question of whether um, I can be said to be creative. I also, I'm also intimidated by the more personal question of whether I should try to be creative. Um, I'm also a, pro, a designer and programmer of video games, as Dolan says, and um, uh, there I thought that I was trying to be creative. And then I listened to this lecture by a guy called Jonathan Blow. It's called um, Video Games as Instruments for Observing Our Universe. Um, it's an extremely important lecture, and in it, uh, Jonathan Blow says that um, a video game is essentially a set of axioms. It is uh, 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 any computer program is behavior created by a human, 
but any computer program will always exhibit behavior that you didn't expect, just like um, someone else brought up robotics. You don't have to think about robots. It's easier to think about computer programs. They always exhibit strange behavior that you did not create. Um, and in, in this respect, so Jonathan Blow says, this is where the beautiful things happen, the things that you didn't expect that come out of the things that you create. <laughs> and uh, in that respect, I think that video games are the place where culture meets science. Ken. I, I'm struck uh, by a number of the questions, and, and it's slightly guilty since I have that I've been too cuddly about creativity. I, I, I think you're right. I think um, discontent, that's a superb uh, element to hold on to, and the notion that it's inner trouble. You know, of, often designers will talk about their work as problem solving, and I do think creativity is very much about problems either out there in the world or, or as the person in the second row there hinted at, you know, problems within ourselves. I think without a sense of trouble and strife and uh, dissatisfaction and disillusionment often with ourselves, there would be a vastly less creative world around us. Okay, so Can you teach creativity? No, you can't. Not certainly in the way that people are trying to today. Um, there are all sorts of people that are now rolled out, particularly for management consultants, to teach them how to be creative. And what they're really doing is talking about how to deal with risk and insecurity. So like creativity has become the buzzword to deal with the kind of strange and, fle strange and flexible times that we live in. What you can do, though, is teach people the basics. And by, when I say basics, I mean big basics. The history of art, how, what scientific methodology is then you need the pressure of an engaged society to raise them up, to kind of push them up. You know, you do think if you lived in times when you had a bit more pressure on you, you might be a bit better, but maybe I'm just making <laughs> excuses. And then I think you need a few good individuals. Okay, I've got Ray and then Colin and Ruth both want to come in. Yeah. Certainly, I don't think creativity can be taught except by a greater creator. And very few people who lay on creative writing classes are greater than the, you know, the writers that they, we should all admire. I very much like the emphasis again and again on craft. That's what I like a lot. And the, I, I resonated, as Ken did, to the discontent observation. I think a great artist is discontented at many levels. He's discontented perhaps with his or her life. He's discontented, or her, with the, what, what has, has, has achieved and discontent with, with the world. So it's a many-layered discontent. It's a divine discontent, as Schopenhauer said, that drives, drives the artist. Um, Yes, science can be creative, of course, and one's got some emblematic moments when scientists, suddenly on the edge of consciousness, realize the solution to problems, Poincaré, Kekulé, and so on and so forth. But uh, I just want to finally take issue with somebody who, at the back, who's been saying the most astonishingly wrong thing I've heard for a long time, <laughs> and I won't name names, I'll just say somebody at the back, said that we, there are no original ideas. Are you sort of implying that... For example, quantum mechanics was there in the grunts of Neanderthals, and that, you know, there's nothing happened since then. Of course, new ideas are coming on stream all the time, genuinely original, genuinely frame-shaping and frame-twisting and frame-breaking ideas. Okay, Colin? Um, I'm very glad design was mentioned, because that seems to me to be another area where all these uh, agendas meet. And, I mean, this could well be called the Royal College of Art and Design, except it's a bit of a crummy title, isn't it? Not as snappy. I mean, James Dyson's an alumnus, you know? I mean, that's, that's creativity, isn't it, of a sort, which we can discuss. Um, within my own area, of course, the question is whether composition can be taught and uh, where does the art and craft come? And, of course, we get a lot of people who are obsessed with rather second-rate English composers uh, uh, from 1900, 1950, many of whose autographs we have in the college. Uh, are they really worthy of the anorak's attention? Well, often they are in terms of the craft, but not the art. Uh, so, making that point again. Thanks. Um, and you can teach craft, and you can, you can do more than that. You can teach people to, you can try and strip away the second-handness mm. of, of, how they, of how they think. So people come to you and they, they often reuse cliches, and you say, well, would you, is that, fre you can show them what the freshness is, but you're trying to get back to the freshness of their own imagination, and it's a kind of discipline. So you can teach a sort of discipline of, of self, self-criticism that is also, if you, you with any luck, a sort of release of what's fresh in them. Um, so you can teach them to listen, perhaps. I also like the discontent, but maybe we could widen that out, which would bring in design to need. Maybe we create out of need. Maybe everybody creates out of need. I don't know if anybody saw, in, in a couple of days ago, there was a photograph in the Metro 
of an octopus that was using a paint lid as protection. And it had picked up its paint lid and um, it was walking around with it. And apparently it's a sort of coconut octopus that normally uses coconuts, but there weren't any coconuts, so it needed something. And it improvised and it came up with a paint lid. And I think that's perhaps um, where art starts. Okay, I'm oh, shit. shit. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I'll try and squeeze in a few more before I give the panelists a minute each to sum up. Okay, uh, first of all, Tiffany's point about um, responding, wanting to respond directly to works in museums and arts. I think there's an issue with a massive, there's a massive problem with the ac academicization of art and us being taught that it's too difficult for us to understand. And actually, I think it's very interesting what Ruth's saying about stripping away and freshness. And I think we need that for our perception as well, not to be told it's too difficult. Um, and just to be presented with these things that are truly fantastic and left to interact with them on our own terms. Secondly, craft, yes, massively important, but as a, as a culture, um, and again, it comes with, you know, with a huge privile privileging of academic right. skills, right. and that culturally, we have massively denigrated craft skills generally. I mean, if you think back to the past about the relationship, for example, with the Glasgow shipbuilding industry and Glasgow College of Art, which was where, you know, I don't know if it's still the case, but parents in shipbuilding, kids would go into the art college and you have that wonderful relationship there. Um, about, about questioning and not questioning um, in creativity, I don't think they're alternatives, I think they're part of the same process. I think there are times when you have to ask questions during it and there are times when you have to let go of the questions and just really, really go with it. Um, and there's a really interesting sort of model of creativity, which a lot of people have probably come across, called the Disney process. Um, and just very, very finally, um, creativity and curiosity, do we make, it, make stuff up or find it out? Um, why is that a dichotomy? People were talking about William Blake earlier, and he definitely saw creativity as a war. So what do we think? I think it was Tiffany who was talking about science trying to dispel love and trying to dispel things. Science doesn't try and dispel anything, it's simply trying to understand. I would argue actually that it is almost using the same process as art, it's simply trying to understand these things. I don't see why, and, and it was certainly, uh, it was touched on by Ruth, science could it can be used to enhance art much more and should be used to enhance art. We have this separation between science and art and both communities do it to each other. Um, and I, we, it, it's really, really silly to me because at the end of the day, it's all about understanding the human process. It's all about furthering the human experience and why the two things can't seem to get along seem to be seems to me utterly ridiculous because when you talk to arts people and you talk to science people all of the same questions come up uh, how do we get funding what's relevant um, <laughs> it, 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 it's all the same questions and yet there's this huge separation between the arts communities and the science communities and I would argue that while there's very relevant science in art there's also a lot of art in science thanks yeah uh, why does it matter at all whether we create things or we find them out? Uh, I just don't think that like, question of the debate has been like, justified. Okay, that's a nice one to conclude on. So, um, in the original order that we spoke... I, I, I'm struck by how we've, uh, maybe we shouldn't be surprised at the Institute of Ideas session, been drifting more and more towards the politics of creativity, the question of why we want to be creative. And we've had the sense it's for our own sake, uh, you know, it's for maybe the sake of democracy, uh, a hint that it's for the sake of warfare, uh, the sake of uh, the economics. And I suppose lurking at the back of our mind is the number of times, and this is you know, absolutely not meant to happen at the Institute of Ideas events, we're all struggling not to say that it's for God's sake. <laughs> Tiffany. The relationship between art and science could be much better, but all the projects that I've seen that aim to relate the two kind of are deeply unilluminating. And, I mean, to be really crass, a really crass example would be not trying to dispel the mystery of love, but, you know, I've seen numerous pictures of artists um, who've done, like, stem cells and painted them or whatever. And that's, that's not science, and that's not very good art. And I do think you have to ask, what does it mean when science starts saying we need art, and art starts saying, saying we need science. And I think there's probably 
an inability in both ways of seeing the world and both methods to justify what they do on their own terms. And so basically art's not able to say, we show reality through the complexity of human experience, and science not able to say, we understand nature. Neither of them are able to fully justify themselves, um, and so they start relying on the other. So I just think we have to be slightly careful and just ask, does this illuminate anything? Not don't do it, but does it illuminate anything? Now I think, to conclude, as you go about your merry way in the next couple of days, just listen to how people use the word creativity and ask yourself, what do they mean by it? I think it's used far too promiscuously, um, imprecisely, to mean a myriad of things, and that begins to make me worry. Right? And I think what we're basically doing is not addressing certain problems in society and instead just saying it's okay because we'll all be creative. Um, that's a slightly bizarre thing to say, but I am confident that if you try and listen out for the word creativity and the number of ways it's used, you'll basically be um, surprised and shocked. And I think we should stop using it. That's the end. Okay, thanks. Colin. Well, I think all of us in this room have got some fighting to do. Are we going to be proactive or reactive in this environment? Because we live in a society of instant gratification. Can we be bothered to sit down and listen to a piece of music for, for an hour? You've been very well behaved in this room. Um, but I, can you go away and actually devote an hour to a piece of art? Because there are so many other distractions. And I'm not just talking about music here. What do we think of pop, from pop star to opera star? I mean, that's not an opera star, for goodness sake. Hamming through an Italian aria with a microphone in your hand. And one or two opera singers wrote in and said that, thank goodness. But we do want to be gratified instantly. It's not going to happen, really. Where are our souls in all this? Thank you. Um, Ruth, perfect timing. Um, yeah, well, I mean, most people are... I don't hear the word creativity from one weekend to the next, actually. I mean, that's probably because I live in a different environment. And, you know, I mean, I don't... People, people in my hearing don't go around talking about creativity. But... Um, we do use uh, poetry and science, I, I think, have masses of things in common. They're both very, very precise. You can't get away with um, fuzzy thinking in either, or fuzzy word use. And um, a lot of poets use science. So, for example, there was a poem in the underground by Joe Shapcott about a quark. I don't know if anybody knows it or has seen it. And it is an interesting thing about a quark looking back at a scientist. And I know scientists who enjoy that sort of poetry because it's, it makes them see it newly. So I'm not in this art and science world, but in the poetry and science world, there's a lot of very interesting cross-fertilization. No justifications, but just an interesting re-seeing. Thank you. Uh, Fairly Ray Someone said, do we need to dichotomise between a discovery and invention? I hope you felt the burden of everything I said in my opening comment was precisely that. It's actually quite difficult to separate those things. And I think there's a deep and interesting question about where invention stops and discovery begins and vice versa. And I do feel that digging deep into that question will lead us into some of the most interesting inquiries uh, that face us as humanists, which is to understand what it is that enables us to make sense of the world and wherein lies the intelligibility of the world. Ken said we should talk about, for God's sake, um, that is a blank term for me, I'm afraid. So I'm, I'm with, with half of Bach. You know, he said that he wrote for the glory of God and for the benefit of my neighbor. And I think on the whole, if I do anything at all, it is for the benefit of my neighbor and also for the benefit of my wallet. But um, <laughs> the, 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 there is, the, I must pick up on this two culture thing. In 1995, I wrote a book bemoaning the fact, call Newton's sleep, your Blake scholars will recognize the reference, bemoaning the fact that there appeared to be two cultures, a la Snow. I've been rather disappointed at those bridges that have been formed between the two cultures, because in the example, for example, neuroesthetics, it seems to me as bonkers as the kind of science that Swift described in the Academia Legado, where the poor scholars were trying to count the number of sunbeams in a cucumber and so on and so forth, that sort of stuff. And it does seem to me there are some places where science and art do make good connections that illuminate both and reach, a, I feel like, a vanishing point from which both imaginary domains arose. But in most cases, they're pretty dismal science and pretty dismal art. One final thing about necessity and war. Yes, necessity is the mother of invention, and out of war came extraordinary developments in radar and so on and so forth. And within art, I think, the pressure of necessity can often transform art even the pressure of commission. One of the greatest dialogues by Paul Valery, who is one of the greatest writers in the 20th century, he had to respond to a commission 
to write something that was ex exactly 32,000 characters long. And in those days, you had to count them with your finger, not with a thing. <laughs> and it's the most brilliant dialogue. So, yes, necessity is sometimes a very important mother, not only of invention, but of creativity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.